Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us one more time. We are Paola and Gabriela, and today we have the pleasure of being here with Dr. Joshua Pais, who has kindly accepted our invitation. Dr. Pais is the teaching assistant professor in the English for Academic Purposes program at George Washington University. He holds a doctorate in teaching English as a second language, as well as certificates in the teaching of writing, program leadership, advanced teaching practice, and educational technology. His research interests include LGBTQ plus issues in applied linguistics, online writing tools to support L2 writers, and identity and professionalization in TESOL. He has also taught at other universities, such as New York University and Wuhan University. In June last year, two of his articles on LGBTQ plus inclusion in ELT were recognized as being in the top 20 most read articles of 2017 and 2018 in TESOL Journal. And he currently serves as an associate editor of the Asian EFL Journal and as a member of the editorial advisory board for TESOL Journal. A lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for being with us today. We're really, really happy to have you here. Okay, to start, um, most of our talk will be about queering ELT. Um, so I think it's a good idea that we start by sharing a definition of what queer means, okay, before we move into our practices, okay? Okay, that sounds good, yeah. Good, can you tell us a bit about this? Totally. Um, and I'm going to start by saying, um, especially in North American English speaking context, um, and I, I guess I would say kind of the, those traditionally defined inner circle English context places like the UK, Ireland, Australia, um, the word queer traditionally has had this kind of negative connotation. It's been used as, as a term of derision, a slander. Um, and what happened in the around the 1960s, 1970s, um, as the, the gay liberation movement kind of took shape in the US, there was this kind of reclaiming of this term, right? So a lot of people, when they see the word queer, whether they're uh, so-called first language users or second language users, um, they may be familiar with this term as a slander, right? They may see it as an offensive term, and it certainly can be. Right. Um, the reason we use it in academic circles is because the field of queer theory and more uh, political oriented movements for uh, LGBTQ liberation have kind of taken this term and reclaimed it. And the reason they did this is because queer gives us access to a term, queer as a noun specifically gives us access to a term that doesn't have the gender connotations of lesbian or gay, right, um, which both carry heavy either masculine or feminine sort of gender connotations with them, queer gives us access to this more inclusive term that can include gender non-binary individuals, um, gender non-conforming individuals, and transgender individuals as well, right? Um, so academically speaking, we've kind of embraced this term because it's more inclusive than lesbian or gay. Um, and it creates space, especially for transgender voices, which are so often ignored uh, both in these communities Right? Um, because when we're talking about transgender individuals, um, people who are born one biological um, sex, right? Um, but who later in life transition to um, a more affirmative gender role for themselves. Um, these people are marginalized even inside of the LGBTQ community. So using this queer term um, is one way uh, that we attempt to create more space for, for, for non-normative individuals, right? Um, so that's queer as a, as a noun. It's just a more inclusive sort of um, moniker for the larger lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, um, gender non-conforming community. <laughs> queer as a verb, um, which is how it's often used when we're talking about um, education, right? Queer as a verb oftentimes means to kind of question those dominant social norms that we see around us, asking ourselves these sort of critical questions. Why is this way? Who benefits? who's disadvantaged, and what would it take um, to make this more inclusive, right? Um, so oftentimes when we see queer as a verb, whether it's in my work or the work of people like Thurston Mears or James Coda or Cynthia Nelson, right, um, there's this temptation to think it only refers to, to sexuality, 
And certainly that's the focus for many of us, right? Um, but when we're talking about clearing something, we're talking about taking this critical approach to lay bare kind of um, the normative forces around us and to interrogate those, right? Um, so that we can attempt to build a more inclusive classroom space for all of our students, right? Whether that's sexuality, gender, physical ability, um, or even uh, neurocognitive ability. When we talk about neurotypical people versus individuals that are on the um, autism spectrum, right? Um, so queer can mean a lot of things. At its core, queer as a verb means to lay bare dominant social discourses and to try to trouble those so that we can bring more people to the table and give more people voice. Okay, good. So then uh, at the practical level, how can we queer our lessons? How, what, how can we teach us queer our lessons, our classes? Yeah, yeah, and this is where I think um, the work of Alistair Pennycook, who is a critical applied linguist, um, and literally wrote the book on critical applied linguistics. Uh, his inter a critical introduction to critical applied linguistics is a great read. I highly recommend it. Um, he came up with this idea called restive problematizing, right? Which is kind of constantly looking at the world around us, asking ourselves, why does it work this way? Whose voices do we hear the loudest, and whose voices are silenced, right? Um, so that we can then attempt to, as educators, yes, acknowledge the loudest voices in the room, but also create space for those marginalized voices, right? Even if it's not, um, even if members of those marginalized communities don't choose to speak up themselves, right? We create space for them either through um, acknowledgement, like in the K-12 setting, this may be thinking about the classroom decorations that we use, right? Um, and how we arrange that space so that it's accessible, not just to uh, people with typical physical ability, but also people with some form of physical disability as well, right? Um, <clears throat> so I think we kind of have to begin from this space of constantly reflecting on what we do and what we bring to the classroom, right? And the assumptions we make about that space. And then asking ourselves, again, those critical questions, which I'll keep coming back to. Why is, why is the world or the classroom or this material this way? Who benefits? who's marginalized, and how can I give uh, acknowledgement and space to these marginalized communities, right? So it really kind of begins from this reflective place for the teacher and returning to that reflective place, right? Um, when we're talking about clearing our, our practice from, from a practical standpoint, it's never really done, which can be exhausting, I acknowledge that, right? Um, but it's necessary work to constantly try to move that needle, you know? Um, once we kind of reflect on our own assumptions, then we can start looking at the materials that we bring with us, asking a similar sort of set of questions, you know? Um, and understanding that when we want to clear our practice, we want to avoid just having a single day or a single unit um, where we include something about a, a gay or lesbian family, right? Or about a transgender athlete, because this kind of sensationalizes it for our students and says, hey, this is kind of a hot, sexy topic that we're gonna talk about for one day and then we're gonna move on with our lives. It only matters on this one day. Um, and that's not the case. So finding ways throughout the curriculum uh, to do this kind of work of um, critically clearing that space and creating uh, room for marginalized voices is important, right? Um, so not just having that one reading on the transgender athlete, but also at the very beginning of the, um, of the class time when you're getting to know your students, uh, creating recognition around the different kinds of pronouns that are available in um, English, right? Including the emergence of singular they, um, which is often used by transgender and gender non-conforming individuals, right? Creating space for students to engage with preferred pronoun use to make theirs known and to model this kind of respectful engagement for students, right? Um, so I would say it begins from reflecting on what we're doing and then looking for space throughout our curriculum where we can engage in this critical work of creating space for marginalized voices and individuals. Okay, that's very, very interesting. Um, you also speak about querying the discourse while you were talking about pronouns mm -hmm. just now, but yeah. at an academic level, okay, mm -hmm. what does querying the discourse mean? And why is it important that the ELT world as a whole queers? It's this course. Yeah, I think this is, so this is for a couple of reasons, right? Language, whenever we use it, is just imbued with so many uh, assumptions that the speaker makes, right? Um, both about the world around them and about the people that they're speaking to, 
right? A good example of this is when I'm talking about uh, my own personal life, which we do all the time as teachers, right? Um, a lot of people think the ELT classroom in particular should be this kind of apolitical, neutral sort of territory. And it's just not, it's impossible for it to be, right? I mean, even the act of me showing up to a classroom with a wedding ring on, right, this embodied act of the wedding ring sends a message to my students, right? And they read it a particular way. Usually they'll read it as I'm married to a woman, which just isn't the case, right? So I'll get a lot of questions about my wife, right? And when we're going to have kids. Answer, not a wife, and never, because I prefer small dogs, they're easier to manage than children, which take a special kind of energy, right? Um, I have the utmost respect for parents and for people who work in K-12 settings, because kids are, oh, so much, so much energy and attention is needed for them. <laughs> it's magical, right? Um, but we, we bring these things into the, into the classroom space with us, right? And so what we mean when we're talking about clearing the discourse is acknowledging the fact that there are a lot of tacit assumptions that are being made, even when we say things like my spouse, right? Um, we've noticed this trend, especially in more, um, socially left-leaning, more socially progressive-leaning spaces like um, especially university classrooms in the U.S. for even straight-identified uh, professors to use the term my spouse because it's gender neutral, right? Um, and they see it as signaling their allyship with the LGBTQ community, right? But our students still read this a particular way when someone says my spouse. Because we live in this kind of heteronormative space, where we assume everyone around us is straight until proven otherwise, and sometimes even if proven otherwise, right? Um, our students will oftentimes read my spouse from a heteronormative viewpoint, right? Of if I'm looking at somebody who presents as physically male, my spouse means the other person presents and performs a female gender identity, right? And so when we leave things unsaid, whether it's in our research or scholarship, or in our classroom practice, if we just accept the status quo, we're reinforcing that normative discourse, right? Um, so when we need to clear the discourse, we need to acknowledge, hey, we all have these underlying assumptions and biases. That's part of being human. We can't get away from this, right? But we need to take a second and look at how we use language to talk about the work that we're doing, right? And make sure that we're not continuing this pattern of marginalization, right? Um, so one thing that we notice when we look at the research and the scholarship that's coming out on LGBTQ issues in TESOL, um, a lot of researchers use the acronym LGBT, right? Um, they oftentimes stop at the Q, or some of them use just LGB. Um, and we might look at this and say, hey, this is a great win. We're talking about this. Wonderful. Um, but if we actually dig into what many of these researchers are saying, myself included in my early work, um, bisexual, transgender, gender non-conforming issues are almost entirely ignored, right? So when we clear the discourse, we don't just accept what's there. We continue to dig deeper, looking for these patterns of uh, normativity and marginalization and attempting to again say, okay, great, we've made progress, let's celebrate that success. But now how do we continue to, to create more inclusive uh, spaces in our research and scholarship, in our classrooms and in our professional communities as well? Uh, this that you're, that you're saying is related to teacher education because mm -hmm. I mean we need to to be knowledgeable about all this in order to actually queer our lessons. Yeah. Uh, we teachers need to have the knowledge and the skills to do so, and this should begin in, in teacher education. So, do you think uh, there is enough teaching of how to queer our lessons, how to queer our discourse uh, in, yeah. in teacher preparation? I wish I could say that there is. Um, I mean, from my knowledge of, of, of the work that people scattered around the globe are doing, I think we're, we're crawling in the right direction, right? I don't wanna say we're moving because it's very, very slow and it's very kind of haphazard, you know? Um, it's typically tied to, to the teacher educator's personal interest, right? Um, like me, I talk about this stuff with, with teachers from across the board in professional meetings because this is what I do. It's what brings me professional joy, right? Um, and, and so it's been kind of a niche thing where it's been largely driven by, by the teacher trainer or teacher educators kind of personal motivations or personal interests. I think as we've seen LGBTQ um, topics take on more national importance, right? Um, 
no matter what your national context is, as we've seen this become a larger part of national conversations around equality and family. Um, we've seen teacher educators begin to respond to this, but one of the things that we notice in the research, both for teacher educators and for um, teachers as well, whether they're early service, mid-career, or um, kind of guide in the wool professionals that have been doing this for decades, everyone feels underprepared to, to tackle this topic, right? Um, teacher educators, because so much of the, the research and scholarship up until I would say probably 2015, 2016 has focused on the more theoretical side of it, right? Even if you look at the work of Cynthia Nelson who gave birth to this area um, in English language teaching, a lot of her work is focused more on interfacing queer theory um, with English language teaching and trying to find space for, for this work to happen, right? She laid a very important foundation that skews more towards the, the scholarly and less towards the practical, right? Um, it's just been in the last five years or so that I think we've seen more practical work being produced uh, by researchers and scholars in ELT. So I think now that needs to start trickling down to um, teacher educators with practical recommendations of, okay, when I'm sitting in front of a group of five, 10, 15, 20 teachers, how do I help them find use for this in the classroom, right? Um, so I think that's the part that we're just now starting to see um, happen. But at the end of the day, right now, nobody feels prepared to, to talk about this. Not the teacher educators and certainly not the teachers themselves. It's one of the biggest sources of resistance that we see um, in research on teachers when it comes to LGBTQ topics. They just don't feel prepared, right? Exactly. That is why we contacted you. We want <laughs> to learn more uh, because yeah. we, we really want to to create some change in our classrooms here in Argentina and, and, and we are eager to learn. Mm -hmm. We are eager to learn. Yeah. Yeah. And I think our students are eager, eager to engage with this as well. Right. Um, and this is one of the things that I've noticed. If I don't bring it in, my students will find ways to bring it in themselves, either personally through how they work with their um, assignments and how they choose to focus their assignments or actively and vocally in how they contribute to, to classroom discussions, right? Good. Um, yes, yes. You, you did mention in one of yeah. your pa papers uh, that um, students of varying ages, different mm -hmm. ages, have shown, and I love the word, in willingness and an eagerness. That, that's great to engage yeah. with these topics. Can you tell us a bit more about those experiences you have had of, of students demanding? That, I mean, there is a concrete demand from your students. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I work mostly with um, 18 to 20 year olds, right? Um, and most of my teaching experience has happened in that university or kind of pre-university sort of context, right? Um, and one of the things that I've noticed is, um, especially in classes that are focused more on that kind of uh, th those kind of beginning levels of uh, that transition from high school to college, right? Um, things like summer programs or conversation programs. We get to know our students a lot, right? And we get to know our students personally. We ask them questions all the time about their life, right? What are your hobbies? What do you enjoy doing? What did you do this weekend? Um, and they ask us the same, you know? Um, and so we were doing a unit when I was at Wuhan on um, relationships and family, right? Which of course brought up questions about American dating. And this is when I was still a young teacher. So I knew in the back of my mind that this was an important thing to do um, when it, making the classroom more inclusive for sexual and gender minorities, right? But I myself didn't know how to do it yet because I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about this, you know, or playing with it. And so every interaction that I had with my students around this topic of dating in the US was framed in this very sort of normative way, right? Always talking about boyfriends and girlfriends, right? Men or uh, the more masculine individual, which usually means the, the male in the relationship takes a more dominant sort of role in it, right? They pay for things. And then one of my students challenged me on this, right? And was like, well, what if I don't want a, 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 a boyfriend, right? This was a, a student presented as, as female and performed a, a female gender identity. Right? And I was like, huh. <laughs> I was taken aback because I was like, okay, I didn't think that you would, you would take it this way. I don't think that she identified as uh, a member of the LGBTQ community, right? Um, at least not as lesbian or bisexual, but she was just 
I think for her, she was being contrarian, right? I was saying, well, you're pushing this like it's a great thing. What if it's not, right? What if I want to focus on my career or something else? And so in that moment, I was kind of taken aback. But this signals to us a student's willingness, I think, um, to say, hey, you know what? Let's, let's pump the brakes. You're, you're pushing this kind of worldview on us with how we talk about this topic, right? You're showing us your biases and your assumptions of what young 18-year-olds have on their mind, which is dating, right? Um, and we see this reified in the curriculum by an entire unit on dating and relationships. What if this isn't for me, right? Um, and so that kind of got me thinking, okay, well, let's, let's start looking at this more, more critically, even how we use language to talk about it. And so after that moment, when I talk about relationships with my students, right, um, whether it's using it as an example or it's an actual unit of focus, I no longer use the term boyfriend or girlfriend. I use purposefully clunky language, right? I say boyfriend or girlfriend. And then a student called me on that. They're like, why is this an either or thing? What if I'm bi? I'm like, okay, I gotcha, okay? Boyfriend and or girlfriend, or whatever makes you happy, right? Because um, I have to acknowledge members of the asexual community as well. Some people, that isn't for them, and that's fine, right? But it's only through, I think, my students kind of pushing back, even, I think, sometimes joking with how I present things, that forces me to see my own blind spots in my teaching, you know? And you're always going to have those. That's fine. Nobody's going to do this perfectly 100% of the time every day. We have to allow ourselves to make mistakes. And our students will make mistakes as well. And I think what needs to happen here and what we need to acknowledge is mistakes are okay as long as they don't shut down communication, right? So we have to teach our students how to handle these communicative missteps around sexuality and gender because they will happen, you know? It's not the end of the world. Yes, you'll run into the occasional interlocutor that gets horribly offended, right? And that's, that person may have other things on their plate, emotionally speaking, and that's fine, you know? But there are respectful ways to handle these mistakes, right? Um, to acknowledge them and to move on in ways that don't denigrate or marginalize sexual or gender minorities. And I think that's part of Oh, okay, the next so, part of the work that we need uh, to do. Here, you right? wrote a whole article definitely mm -hmm. about the need to queer L to writing. Oh yeah. And that called our attention because we tend to associate queering with other skills, such mm -hmm. as reading or speaking. So yeah. what motivated you to do so? Yeah. Um, so I did my uh, PhD at Purdue University, which means I was working um, closely with Tony Silva, who was the director of the ESL writing program there and one of the major professors in, in the program. So I had a lot of interaction uh, with him and he's, um, he's one of the, the original names. I think if you were a kid in the 90s, they would call them OGs. I don't know what kids today call them, uh, but he was one of the, the big names in, in LT writing. It was his bread and butter. Uh, so because I had a lot of exposure to it through my graduate study, um, I came to realize as I was reading stuff um, in English language teaching and applied linguistics about queer issues, um, the writing classroom was almost never brought up, right? Um, this is despite the fact that if we look at the field of rhetoric and composition, which is kind of the, um, the native speaker or the so-called native speaker equivalent of um, the L2 writing classroom and the field of L2 writing, they engage with queer issues a lot, right? Um, and I think that's because they see it as the productive side of, of reading, right? It's the productive part of that literacy equation. And so if we're willing to, especially in the field of rhetoric, rhetoric and composition, give our students queer text for reading, we should be willing to also accept the production of queer text, right? Um, and this can take, I think, in the field of L2 writing, a couple of different forms, right? Um, one is understanding that students may, as students are often want to do, even when we create the most robust assignment prompt, right, they love to find ways to creatively play with those prompts to make it their own into something that interests them, right? And I think understanding that our expectations of the genres that our students produce may be mismatched from their own, right? And there are certain normative assumptions that we're making when we're teaching things like a research paper, right? Um, understanding that there may be other equally valued and valuable ways of doing that, 
um, that may come from the student's own cultural background and socioeconomic background, right? Even if we look at something as simple as the narrative, and narrative writing is a very common um, written genre, especially in beginner and lower intermediate levels, because it's relatively straightforward, right? We all tell stories all of the time, right? We tell stories about ourselves and about others, and we all encounter stories all of the time, <laughs> whether it's through um, written media or through video games or through um, <coughs> uh, movies, right? So we're all familiar with narratives, but what makes up uh, a good narrative is different, right? The way that I tell a story as a North American so-called native speaker of English and a person who is functionally monolingual, right, is very different than the way that my friend who is a native speaker of, of Libyan Arabic tells a story, right? What we expect um, in storytelling is different, right? Um, so part of what I think we're talking about when we are talking about the need to queer L2 writing is not just creating space for sexual and gender minority students to feel comfortable sharing that voice and those perspectives with us in their written assignments, right? But also queering what we think of as a good written assignment to begin with, right? So if we're looking at a student's written narrative and we're seeing a lot of these digressions away from linear storytelling that we expect in um, at least North American English. Is this bad writing on the part of the student or are we seeing some artifact of the native language and the native culture coming to play here, right? And is this necessarily a bad thing that we're seeing what other linguists might identify as L1 interference? Is it really interference or is this the student creatively using all of their linguistic and cultural tools to tell a story that's unique to them, you know? And I think if we take the, the traditional normative approach, we would say, that's bad writing. But is it really? Or is it just accented writing and writing that we're not used to seeing, right? There might still be great value in that and ways to help the student make that even more effective, right? So, so I'd say that that's the other part of what we're looking at when it comes okay. to clearing is creating value around multilingual, multi rhetorical resources in ways that we just don't traditionally. Because I think part of the assumption is you're writing for native speakers. Well, for most of the world, no, you're not. No. Yes, this, this has to do with intercultural awareness as, as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there is a clear relation between queer in our classes, queer in our practices, and yeah. being aware of the other cultures, right? Yeah, yeah. And I would say that this is where um, the, the queer approach is, is helpful. And it's not just about sexuality and gender, right? It's also about how we view which linguistic resources and which linguistic performances we value as educators and which ones we show our students have value, right? Um, and this is one of the things that we run into in the field of, of L2 writing. Um, in recent years, we've been saying, hey, if we're willing to accept that a person will speak with an accent, we should also be willing to accept that a person is going to speak, or I'm sorry, is going to write with an accent, right? Which, when this idea first came out, was very radical. Because the idea was, if we're teaching you how to write in English, then your writing should mirror that of the native speaker, but does it really need to? And I think we've seen this emergence of global literatures written in English, but not necessarily written for English native speakers primarily, right? Um, that allow us to create value. And when our students see things reflected, in, see their own linguistic abilities reflected in this way, it can be really empowering for them, right? And can show them, hey, you know what? Yes, a text might be written in English and it might look like a relatively standard English text, but there may be layers of nuance and meaning that only I can get, because I'm a native speaker of Chinese, and this was written in China English by an author like Hajin, that, hey, you know what, Dr. Pais, you might love this, love this book, but you're never going to understand it the way that I do, because Hajin is ultimately writing for me. He's writing about the Chinese experience, yes, in a way that's accessible to a global audience, but there are additional layers of meaning here because he's using all of his linguistic resources, all of his multilingual ability and not just conforming to English linguistic or rhetorical expectations. And I think this is the other thing that we can get when we queer L2 writing is this value around multilingual, multi-rhetorical resources that you just can't get any other way. Okay, that's very, very interesting. Um, when we think about queer in the classroom, 
we generally have our students in mind, like, like, like yeah. you were saying before, like uh, providing opportunities for, this, um, for developing these habits of mind, mm -hmm. as you were saying, to be critical about normative discourses, all normative yeah. discourses. But what about LGBTQ plus teachers? Are there any challenges that they face, uh, any obstacles they encounter at the moment of querying their practice? Certainly, I think part of the concern for, first I want to say all teachers, but especially LGBTQ teachers, um, when it comes to creating a more um, inclusive classroom space for sexual and gender minorities, is this concern that you're going to out yourself, right? That you'll be perceived as a member of this community, even if you're not. Um, and this can be a very real concern, especially in uh, K-12 settings, where we don't just have students as stakeholders, but we have parents as stakeholders too. Right? Um, and there have been cases in the US and I'm certain um, worldwide where we've had a teacher attempt to take a more comprehensive approach, whether it's comprehensive sexual education or just including alternative um, non-normative families in units on family or including queer readings um, in their assigned course readings that have met with parental backlash. Right. Um, and it might be a small percentage of the parents that would push back on this, but they're loud, right? And this has led to problems for some teachers up to and including termination, right? So I think that this is a very real concern, especially for um, LGBTQ teachers who may already see themselves as at risk, right? Um, because if it gets out, even if that is their personal life, um, that they are a member of the LGBTQ community, that there may be some form of backlash from more conservative elements um, in their social setting, whether it's more conservative administrators or, or uh, parents, right? Um, because we've, we've heard these refrains before. I don't want my teacher learn, or I don't want my student or my child learning from a queer teacher. They're amoral and they're going to corrupt my student. Well, no, they're not. They're just trying to live their life the same way that you are. And this is one aspect of, of who they are, right? Um, it's just a, a more marginalized, less visible aspect. You know, so I think that this is, this is one very real concern. I think another concern for LGBTQ teachers is one that again is shared with, with all educators trying to do this, that they're going to make mistakes. They're going to make missteps, you know, because this is a huge, very, um, dappled sort of community and what it means to be a cisgender gay man in the US is not what it means to be a cisgender gay man in Taiwan. These are different lived experiences, right? We use language to talk about these experiences in different ways and we have different values about them. Um, so I think uh, queer identified teachers also have this concern that they're going to misrepresent something or that they're going to be, excuse me, marginalizing or reductive in some way. You know, but they also have the added burden of everybody expects them to be the expert because, hey, you're gay or you're lesbian, so you should know it all. Well, no, I know my experience with this, right? And I can share that with you, but understand that's gonna be completely different for a, a person of color or an indigenous queer person, right? Who is already a member of a marginalized community in our society is now also part of another marginalized community and may not even be accepted the same way that I might be. Um, in the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community, right? Um, so I think we share many of the same concerns, but we have this added concern of everybody thinks we should be an expert in all of this um, when we're not. A lot of times we're figuring out parts of this too, especially when it comes to issues of uh, bisexual, transgender, and gender non-conforming individuals. You know, a lot of gay and lesbian teachers just have no idea, you know, because we don't encounter um, trans members of the community that often either for some of us, right? Um, so I think there, there, there's some additional layers here as well as far as what we expect of um, the level of expertise and comfort with addressing these things. Definitely, yes, you're right. A lot depends on, on, on our experience, personal experience, mm -hmm. but uh, as you said, effort is not enough. Yeah. It's good to start. Yes, but then we need to go on reading and learning in order to um, be able to deal with these issues in, in, in our classes, definitely. As Paul yeah. said, we need the, the skills and the knowledge to do so mm -hmm. in order to queer our, our lessons. Um, 
You mentioned in one of your papers that one way of querying our lessons could be the application of critical inquiry. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, and you mentioned that at the beginning of the chat as well. Yeah. Um, how can we do this at secondary school or with children? Because uh, you mentioned yeah. that your students are between 18 and 20 years old. Yeah. How can we do this with younger students? Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes we, we discount how, how critical young learners can be, right? Um, my experience with young learners has been either online teaching, which has been very, very kind of structured and dictated by, by the organization that I was working for, right? Or with my two little sisters who are a decade, a, a decade my junior, right? Um, so when I was a teenager, they were in their, their single digits. Um, and one of the things that I think we notice about many children, I'm not going to say all, but many children, um, is this curiosity about the world around them and how it works, you know? Um, I think most of us have th this kind of cultural meme that children are always asking why, right? And you give them an, an answer to that first why and you get another why, right? Um, constantly trying to figure out how the world and society around them works, sometimes in very explicit ways, right? So I think we need to tap into the curiosity of young learners and we need to nurture that, right? And kind of surrender the fact that yes, I want to get through my material and I might have my school, my school lead telling me I have to get through this material to prepare you for the standardized exam, right? But how do we create value around this curiosity, right? And kind of model this, okay, well, let's not just stop at that, that first why. Let's not just accept the first answer that I'm giving you, right? Let's continue to dig deeper and let's see what other answers to why we might find, right? Me and this group of students, we might find one answer to why this and this other group of students might find another one. Um, and I think another thing that we see with, with some children is this oddly innate awareness of, of fairness, right? Because um, I know anytime I played with my little sisters, sometimes the first response to if they thought I was cheating was, well, that's not fair, right? Or if they saw that uh, one of the sisters got in, in, an extra ice cream and they didn't, well, that's not fair. Right? Again, tapping into this understanding of fairness and saying, okay, if we, let's say that we encounter a student who uses a homophobic or a transphobic slur, right? taking a moment to pause and not, not punish that student, which is kind of the knee-jerk reaction to say, no, no, don't say that ever, right? But to engage with, with the student and say, okay, let's see, why did you choose to say this, right? And is using a word like this, right? Is calling somebody gay if they're not, is this fair to that person, right? Is this treating them kindly? You know, and I think engaging with it on, with it on their level is, is an important tactic, you know? Um, but I think that they already have this kind of curiosity about the world, and I think they have this innate understanding of, or innate awareness of fairness, right? Um, but then it becomes a challenge of finding materials that work with them. And there have been a lot of children's books um, published in the US and Canada of late that have looked at and had queer characters in them, right? Either the mom and either there are two moms or two dads or the child themselves identifies as transgender, right? Um, so there've been a lot of um, authentic materials produced in the past couple of years that's at that child's level. Um, and sometimes making those available as well is another important step. I find with young learners, it's sometimes more about awareness raising. And I think this is also true of, of learners who are at that uh, beginner or early intermediate level. It's less about, um, critical engagement is less about kind of hearts and mind and shifting perspective and more about raising awareness, right? And sometimes guiding them through that awareness raising process. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Sometimes teachers uh, do have to use certain materials, certain mm -hmm. course books, certain textbooks in their classes. Uh, they cannot decide, right. uh, but they can indeed, it's a political decision, as we always mm -hmm. say, to intervene that material to make it more inclusive. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes that might mean supplementing it, right, or making kind of in the moment sort of additions, you know, saying, hey, this is one way, what are some others, right, and encouraging students to share where comfortable uh, from their own perspectives. Definitely. Okay, so um, to finish, um, how do you think everything that we have discussed today contributes to social justice? Yeah, 
I think any time that we can begin to identify patterns of marginalization around us and we can make our students aware of that, right, then we can equip them with the tools that they need, not just to advocate for themselves, you know, because many of our students that we encounter, they may be from middle or upper socioeconomic tiers. They may be from dominant racial or ethnic groups in society, right? They may not be familiar with what marginalization looks like and feels like because that's not their lived experience. And, and we have to respect that. But that also means that then what we need to do is we need to show them the, the marginalization that exists, right? How to respectfully engage with marginalized people so that if they don't have to advocate for themselves at any point, they can at least have the tools that they need to advocate for others, whether it's their friends or family members, um, or even strangers, if they see somebody being verbally assaulted in, in public transit, right? Um, it becomes, I think for me, the way this interfaces with social justice as a whole is about creating space for increased inclusion and equity, but then equipping all students, regardless of their sexual or gender identity, with the tools that they need to advocate for themselves and for others in both the native language and the target language. Okay, good. This has been so interesting. We could continue talking with you for yeah. hours. It's been fun. Definitely, we could. Uh, but I'm running out of battery. People, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's been a, I have no power at home. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm running I'm out really of battery, understand. but I would definitely go on uh, with this chat for hours. We, we need to learn a lot from you and your research and your work. Uh, this is very, very interesting, definitely. We will be yeah, sharing some you of your wonder, articles. Huh? We will be sharing uh, some of ah, your articles thank you. so that teachers can read. Yes. And as questions come up, either from either of you or from um, the teachers, feel free to shoot me a, a message or an email and I will respond to them because sometimes uh, we don't know what those are going to be until we actually encounter them. So I'm happy to, to keep interfacing um, as we need to. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Cool. Thank you. You guys have a good one and good luck with the, uh, the storm. Oh, the power outage. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. You guys have a good one.